Hello and welcome to this tutorial on struts2. We have covered a lot of topics over the past few tutorials and if you think about it, we now know how to establish a complete request response cycle. We can take in a request, we can take in input parameters, we can write an action class that handles the request, we can write the execute method that handles the request, calls business services or whatever. And then when the response is ready, we know how to pass on the response to the user through a JSP file. We know how to redirect in case of different scenarios. So we do have the basic request response. We understood how to write the basic flow, but then there are a lot of miscellaneous things that, uh, you know, that are features of struts too, or those are things that you would need to do in order to write a real world application. I'll try to cover a lot of such miscellaneous items in this tutorial. So it'll not only be the items uh, that we haven't covered so far, but they'll also be best practices. So it'll be a repetition of something that we've done earlier, but then those are the ideal ways to do it. And they are tried and tested formulas that you can apply to real world applications as well. So let's get started. I will use, uh, I'll take a use case of a login page. So we have a tutorial finder application. We've already written some code to use actions. What I will do now is I'll have a login page and I will have a login action class that's gonna check the user ID and the password and then redirect to this tutorial finder form. So this will give us a good opportunity to understand all these best practices and uh, these minor miscellaneous topics. So hopefully we'll have a good understanding of all those things when we are done. So in order to create a login page, first I will use a JSP, which will be the login JSP. And then when I submit the user ID and the password, I will have a login action that handles that submission. So I'll go ahead and create a JSP. I'll call this login dot JSP. So it'll be in the web folder. I have this login dot JSP. Now in the login dot JSP, I'll be having a text box and a There'll be two text boxes, one is for the user ID, one is the password, and then there will be a submit button. So we've learned in the previous tutorial that even though you can write HTML tags for this, it's encouraged to use struts2 tags. So that's what we're gonna be doing this time. So I'll just pick up this tag lib from my previous page and I'll just add it over here. Okay, so now we have the tag lib and we are all set to write struts2 tags. So again, I'm gonna copy the form over here. I'll be making a few changes. So you remember this is the struts form that we had used in the previous tutorial. So we have a SQLin form and then action. We're gonna delete this action and I'll fill it up later when I have the action class ready. So this is something we need to get back to. Now here, we already have a text box and uh, we'll have to change the label as well as the key. So the key is gonna be the property name of the variable in my action where I wanna store the user ID. So let me call this as user ID for now, but then I need to remember to use the member variable name user ID when I'm creating my action class. So I will change this as login ID, so this is my label that gets displayed to the left of the text box. I need to add another text field over here, so I can just duplicate this and call this the password. Okay, so this, this would work, but then there's one characteristic of a uh, password text box typically, which is that whatever you enter in the password text box is, is not visible. So you have a separate attribute in uh, a HTML tag to do that. Uh, where there is actually a struts2 equivalent as well. So in the case of a password text box, what you do is instead of using this text field tag, what you can do is use a tag called s colon password. Now the s colon password has a lot of similar uh, properties as the text field and uh, you can use the label and the key even for that. And for all practical purposes, it behaves like a text field. Uh, one major difference is that when you enter text into the password text box, you don't actually see 
the characters, which behaves like a typical password text box. So this works fine for our purpose. So now we have a user ID text box and a password text box, and we have a submit button. So this actually completes our login page. So I will save this and we are actually done. So what I can also do is I can use the, the welcome file list to add one more of this. Actually, you can delete the other ones if you want because they're not really there. So I will change this to login.jsp. So what's going to happen is when we run this tutorial finder application, the login.jsp is the page that will greet the user. So that way it's handy to have that in the welcome file list. So I will save this as well. And now we have the first page ready. So now the user enters the user ID, enters the password, and then hits submit. So what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next is this is what's going to happen. The action that we add over here is what's going to get called. So we need to have an action class and we need to have a starts mapping. So let's go ahead and do that now. So in the source, I will create a new action class. I'll call this login action. I'll put this in the action package and hit finish. Okay, so in my login action, as usual, I need to have a public string execute. And here I'm gonna use, uh, I'm gonna write some code to evaluate the user ID and password that's entered. Now you know that in order to use the user ID and password that was sent as a part of the request, we need to have member variables for user ID and password. So I'll do that now. I'll have a private string user ID and a private string password. Again, remember that these two should correspond to the keys over here, which they do. So we're good here. So I'll create the getters and setters for these two. Okay, so we are done. Now we could write some logic here to evaluate the user ID and the password. So it could be a call to a business service, but in this scenario, I'm just gonna statically verify if the user ID and password are a particular text. So I will have a if get user ID dot equals I'll have a user ID. It's going to be a static value. So as long as the user enters the user ID, this check is going to pass. All right. And now the password. I will have a same check for the password as well. So I'll have and get password that equals password. So I'm doing a static check you know, as long as the user ID is this string and the password is this string, I'm gonna let the user in, but then if it's anything else, I'm not gonna let the user in. So again, as I said, this could be a business service that talks to a database and verifies the user ID and password, but for our illustration, I think this should suffice. So I will actually, once I'm here, this is an if condition, right? So if the user has entered the right user ID and password, I'm gonna return, success. Okay. And uh, if this is not the case, whenever the user ID is not this, and the password is not this, I'm going to return failure. Okay. So this is all that the execute method needs to do. So it's going to verify the user ID and the password match, in which case it's going to return one string. And then if the user ID and password does not match, it's going to return another string. So that's all that this needs to do. But what's the benefit of returning two different strings? Well, the benefit is I can map each string to a particular 
action class or a particular JSP. So the return actually signifies the you know where the flow is going to take you to next. So a different return could mean that it's going taking you to a different JSP or a different action. So as far as the execute method is concerned, this is all that it needs to do. So all I need to do is in the starts XML map success to a success page or the page which you want the user to see when a successful login happens and I need to map failure to an error page or any page that you want the user to see when there is a login failure. It could be the login page again. Okay, so this is all I am doing in the execute for now and we'll again visit this later with a couple of best practices that uh, that make this code a little bit better. Okay, so I will save this one and then go to the struts XML. Now I need to establish a mapping for this for this action. So I will have a new package over here. I don't want the login to be in the tutorial's namespace. So I will create a new package. So I will call the package. In fact, why don't I just copy this? And paste this here. So the namespace is going to be slash okay i'm not going to add any namespace over here and then the action name i can give any name i want over here i'll be giving the name as login because this is the login action that we are writing and uh the class would be the class that we just wrote so this would be login action now there are two results that we've copy pasted now let's take a look at the results that we're actually using we're using success and failure which is fine so we do have success and failure, but then we need to map this to where we want to redirect the user to. So in the case of a success, I want the user to see the search form.jsp and uh, the search form.jsp is in, oh, it's actually in the root. So I don't have to give any path. I can just change this to, search form.jsp. And in the case of a failure, I want to redirect the user back to the login page. So this would be login.jsp. Okay, so I'll save this. And uh, I'm not going to do any error messaging over here, and we can take that up as the next tutorial. But for now, I'm just going to redirect the user back to the login page. And finally, the package has a name and the name is same as the default over here because we just copied it. Every package needs to have a unique name. So I'm gonna change this name. I'm gonna call the package as login as well. Um, and just remember that a package needs to have a unique name. So we have fixed that and now I can go ahead and save the start XML. Okay, so this configuration is done. Now that we have an action name. Let's go back to the login.jsp and configure the action value that we had left out over here. So this is a form that posts this value to login. So this is all that's required. I don't need to have a dot action that we had already seen in the previous tutorial and uh, there's no namespace over here. So all I need to do is enter the action name and then stretch knows what to do. So I will save this one as well. And now let's try running this project. So I will say run as run on server. Okay, so it's the black text box again. I really have no idea why it's showing up like this, but let me open this up in a browser. And again, notice that I don't have to enter a URL since we had that entry into the the welcome file list, login.jsp is automatically rendered. So let me just copy this and open this in a browser. Okay. So we have a login ID and a password text box that's generated by struts two tags. So I will have the user ID as the static value that we expect and the password as password, the static value that we expect as well. And when I hit submit, it's going to take you to the to the search form page. Okay, so let's go back and enter a wrong user ID. And whatever password doesn't matter, if I hit submit, it's going to take us back to the login page. So this 
is the basic functionality of a login, which is working fine. Of course, we don't have the error messaging over here, but then that's something we'll tackle in the subsequent tutorial. Okay, so now that we have established this, um, this login page and functionality, let's talk a little bit about some of the best practices.